Hi, my name is Steven Stronichek, and I'm with HorrorOrigins.com. Horror Origins is a website where you can find articles, reviews, and interviews. We also run our very own film festival and screenplay competition. I'm here talking with Sean Nichols Lynch, the director of Red Snow, which is part of the Horror Origins Film Festival. Thank you for talking. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited. I really enjoyed the film. Um, really, Thank really you. enjoyed cinematography, really enjoyed the script a lot. Very strong script. So um, I usually like to start these interviews off by asking what got you into the horror genre? Oh, man, from from the earliest age, I can remember, I was the kid who'd go to like the, the video rental store and just like beeline to the horror section and just like look at all the covers. And I think my gateway horror was like, the Universal Studios monster movies, for whatever reason, I got really into like the Bela Lugosi Dracula and like the OG Frankenstein and Wolfman, like really early, like three or four. And yeah, I was just attracted to all of that stuff, like, you know, the Goosebumps books and, uh, you know, and I just, I just needed to devour it all. And I just got into more and more uh, weird shit as, uh, <laughs> as I got older. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think that's uh, I think that's the route that all of most of us took. Uh, definitely those Goosebumps books, you know, it's just that oh, uh, yeah. that feeling you get in your stomach. You're like, man, that's cool. It's weird, but it's cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so Red Snow is uh, about a horror like romance novelist or so who encounters some vampires. Yeah, which is, I mean, it's a wonderful premise, but, uh, and I, I wanted to ask about what the genesis of that story was for you. I mean, it was one of those things that came together really organically for me. I mean, I had, a, I remember at the time I had a few different projects, mostly horror that I was trying to get off the ground. And, um, you know, I was just thinking like, I love vampires. I love Christmas horror, you know, like Black Christmas and Gremlins and that sort of thing. And I'd never really seen them put together in that way. I mean, not successfully. Um, I've seen some interesting things, but like not not to, like to my taste. And, um, you know, I just sort of, it was just one of those things that I started thinking about, like, what would that look like if I did a vampire Christmas movie? And, you know, I uh, the Tahoe setting seemed really natural to me. Uh, and just having it be about a writer who who encounters the real thing and, you know, just like it was a story that actually came together really quickly once I had the first spark. Like some things that I work on take years to develop, but this was a really quick one. Like it, it just it was something that I got very excited about and really wanted to just do it. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I I love it when that happens. Honestly, whenever you just like you get the first spark and then the script just happens. That's kind of it. Like good. I mean, yeah. I, uh, it's always so much easier in that case. Um, and I think the vampire and Christmas horror thing works out really well. I, I love the use of the um, the carol instrumental and how it kind of really helps roll everything together just wonderfully. Yeah. Um, so it is a low budget horror film. Um, and I'm always interested in how those productions get started and like what gets those going because it's always a lot more interesting than whatever big, you know, yeah, budget man. thing is. So how'd you get there? Yeah, you know, um, like I said, like I it was at a time when I was trying to get various things funded with like no success. I had a lot of meetings with people who like to talk about producing mm -hmm. movies, but uh, very few actually would, would wanted to do it or had the means to do it and you know just at a time of like you know much like uh Olivia in the movie is like a time of like creative frustration and you know I'd done one other feature prior to this that wasn't horror but it was made in a similar way and that it was kind of like you know fuck it I'm just gonna make a movie and uh and, you know and however I can and in this case uh it was really just a combination of crowdfunding we had a seed and spark campaign to raise you know 20 grand approximately and then the rest of it was just you know scraping together scrapping together credit cards all that horrible stuff yeah <laughs> all that stressful stuff but uh you know it was but i think the difference on this one was i went in knowing that it was going to be a shoestring budget mm -hmm. i was going to bring in all my friends from film school at san francisco state like gavin murray are my mm -hmm. excellent cinematographer uh and 
the whole, most of the team were SF State alums. Alric, my producer, most of the cast was SF State. And, um, you know, just like bringing in a team and saying, you know, hey, we're, you know, it's going to it's going to be hard, but and you're not going to make much money, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's, it's going to be fun. Like, and I think that that was kind of the vibe that you have to have when you're making a low budget horror. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that actually leads to into the next question really well, which is uh, I, I think your lead actress is great. She's wonderful. I mean, she 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 really toes the line that needs to be towed for this film. Um, and I think the whole cast does a great job um, kind of towing a very similar line to like stuff that you see in Cronenberg or Usna or whatever, where it's like it's a little it's a it's a little stagey, but it's it's so genuine. And uh, I just wanted to ask about how you went about finding the wonderful cast here and just how it worked out. Yeah. Uh, always happy to be compared to Brian Usna or Cronenberg. Yeah, I got my society. <laughs> I know right the society here. back there. You got a lot of winners back there. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny. I've told this story before, but uh, this I don't think this movie would really exist without Denise, the the lead actress, because mm -hmm. I ran into her. You know, again, we uh, we had been friends in college, and um, you know, she was in the theater department, I was in the cinema department, and. Um, our paths had crossed a lot, but I'd never really directed her in anything. And I ran into her around the time I was thinking about doing something like this, like sort of doing a, you know, intimate, small cast, almost single location horror. And, you know, Denise just has that kind of energy. And so I very much wrote that part around her. And then with um, Nico, who plays Luke, it was a similar <laughs> thing where you know, I'd actually directed his brother, Ben, in my first feature, and I, I, and I, you know, leaned on Nico for a bunch of different things over the years, but I'd never really, like, written him apart in anything, and, uh, and I felt like he would have been great, I, I just really felt like he'd be great for this, he kind of had that look I was looking for, and yeah, that was the sort of thing, like, a rare case of, like, building the leads around people I already knew, which I think worked out really well, I'd never really done that before. And then the rest of the cast came together through casting and, you know, we got Vernon Wells for two days to like be our kind of Donald Pleasance, like our, our, yeah, uh, yeah. our you know, our recognizable face. I, Michael you know, Parks, I, that's, you know. That's what I always say to people who do low budget horror is like, write in a part for like some recognizable <laughs> dude, right. you know, and to, to get a couple days with him because it definitely helps uh, legitimize your, your film. And he was great. Yeah, he uh, he really reminded me of like Michael Parks and like Tusk and just those just the weirdness. <laughs> you know, you get that one guy where you just put a camera in front of his face and that face just tells you everything and you're fine. You can oh yeah, tell the whole movie. Um, but uh, I, you know, speaking of that camera and so uh, something that yeah, I I would tie back to Cronenberg or Usna or stuff like that is the cinematography of your film, uh, which it's. A lot of horror, modern horror, like goes the underlit route. You know, it goes the, totally. uh, the soft light. Aster does that a lot. Of course, you know, Robert Eggers and all that. But something that I really appreciated in Red Snow was this uh, this kind of theatricality. Like it's got these great like top lights going off of people and mm -hmm. the way that the light go and it's 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 not over lit. It's just theatrical enough where it, it gives a bit of gravitas to the proceedings. And uh, I, yeah. I, I think it's important in horror. And um, uh, I just wanted to ask you about developing that with your cinematographer. Yeah, Gavin and I talked a lot about exactly what you're talking about. Um, you know, not not to say that I dislike the underlit uh, <laughs> fad, well, well, just trend that's going on now. But, you know, I, I, we had the mentality, Gavin and I, that this is a Christmas movie. It should feel like cheery and ha and like have that really bright, almost overlit look, <laughs> especially in the interiors and we're in Olivia's cabin like a lot of like really hard reds. Um, and and I think like the, I mean, the exception to that was a lot of the exteriors that we did mm -hmm. out in the woods. Um, that, that was the only occasion where, you know, Gavin had, and um, his g &E team had this great thing going where it was like, it was really just like these heavy duty lights just like deep in the woods that were giving enough soft light for those um, night exteriors. But yeah, it's, um, you know, I, and it was, uh, I think the, the, orig the original idea we had for the look 
um, or maybe this is something that Gavin talked me down from was like, it should almost feel like a Hallmark Channel uh, <laughs> Christmas movie that gets invaded by vampires. And I think that Gavin has too much taste to actually do that. I think that he talked me down from that a little bit because I think I wanted to go even more extreme on what you're talking about. Yeah. I think I wanted it to look like a Hallmark Channel movie, but Gavin just, just did an excellent job with this movie. Um, and uh, and hit the team that he put together on on camera and, and uh, the GNE team is uh, was did a great job. Given, especially given that we mm -hmm. shot most of this in a twelve day like really fast oh, wow. shoot with wow, like yeah. one pickup day. Yeah, it's a lot. I mean, <laughs> now I'm just thinking about you telling your cinematographer, "Yeah, it's gonna be sixty frames per second. It's gonna look like a Hallmark." <laughs> no, it's like, oh, it's always gonna be twenty four, but uh, yeah, I think the the the, the lighting. Um, I wanted it even hard. It's funny because like I've seen that pop up, like especially after we played Fright Fest, mm -hmm. I saw some reviews where it's like, oh, they overlit everything. And it's like, <gasps> man, you should have seen how I wanted it to look <laughs> because I wanted to go even more extreme. Well, it, you know, I I personally I I, I kind of miss the mo miss movies being like having that level of melodrama to the lighting like it yeah. it adds something especially to you know stuff that uh stuff that where you're kind of stretching some of the um uh, the realism you're kind of stretching some of the uh story points or so i mean it it works yeah yeah and i and like it's not really supposed to be a grounded horror i think mm -hmm. that's another difference is it's supposed to be a heightened kind of world like I that's you know that's what I told every actor that was that that came on the set is like it's it's an exaggerated reality and we're kind of going for an almost sort of comic booky larger than life kind of vibe yeah 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 so I especially for low budget horror set stories are great you you will hear the craziest shit you've ever heard from oh, yeah. set stories on low budget horror films. What is the craziest thing that happened on this set? Oh man, I mean, <laughs> we had some real scares. Uh, I mean, it was a, it was a very <laughs> safe set. Uh, we we took you know like we took our our you know we were very careful, uh, especially shooting out in the extreme cold and everything. But one <laughs> thing that really freaked me out early on was, you know, uh, Melanie Leandro, who did the the uh, makeup effects, mm -hmm. and she did a great job. It was really just her doing it. Um, she had asked me before, like, what the vampires should look like. And and we I we talked about it a lot. And I we both kind of felt it should be sort of a minimal look. It's, you know, we wanted to do the, the teeth and the eyes and, and not any prosthetics, just like mm -hmm. minimal like shading and that sort of thing. And uh, she asked me specifically what I wanted the eyes to look like. And originally I was thinking, well, I just want them to be like blank white when they're in like vampire mode. And you see some of that in the film. Mm -hmm. be, uh, you see it specifically when uh, Luke is like really weakened is his eyes are like milky white. And originally this is a real low budget horror story. Originally, that was going to be how they always look, as they just always have those white eyes. But the um, the first day that uh, Nico is shooting in the vampire makeup, he puts in those contacts and he's like, I'm blind. I can't see anything. And I was like, oh, well, like what level of visibility? And he's like, zero <laughs> percent. And and it's like we could not have all the vampires blind and like these crazy action scenes or like acting. <laughs> so immediately we had to like put in a rush order for the different contact lenses that you see on the vampires for most of the movie. But that was the sort of thing where it's like we had to make a decision. You know, it's a 12 day shoot. Mm -hmm. We can't lose a day or God right. forbid do. So it's sort of like, OK, we'll reschedule things. Well, you know, well, well, you know, luckily enough, we were already planning on doing scenes where Luke is like weak and wounded. Right, right. As I said to Nico, like, do you think you can do these scenes blind? You know, like, <laughs> like, do you think you can do this like without sight? And he was right. a real trooper about it. I think the <laughs> hardest for him was the end of the film where he's mm -hmm. not only blind, but he's also like covered in fake blood. Right, right. Uh, and just that was like. <laughs> It was crazy that he was able to do that. Like that's again, like that's that's the difference with a real great actor. <laughs> they they roll with the punches and they they still are able to do it. There's a couple shots I I can tell that he cannot see. <laughs> 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 
the mug of blood. It's like he's kind of feeling around for it. Right, right. But, you know, it was one of those things that were, you know, all the big mistakes on this movie kind of ended up working in our favor, weirdly. Mm-hmm. Like, also just like with the level of snow we got, um, you know, the days that we needed those exteriors, it just dumped snow. Mm-hmm. And the days when we were inside, it didn't. And it was like very, it was, it was there were some serendipitous things that happened on this one. But the biggest one was the the contact lenses mm. because that actually I actually prefer the look where you can see the pupils. So it's yeah, kind of yeah, like looks that, great. That ended up like I it was sort of like a bad decision that I made got corrected <laughs> by by like mistake just by happenstance. So that was kind of just rolling with the punches, uh, indie filmmaking stuff. I am I'm sure the eye lines were. Were, were so easy to get <laughs> with those white contacts. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, luckily when there's no pupils, the, the eye lights, <laughs> you have a little room for error. <laughs> you just like point his head like where right, right. he needs to go. <laughs> yeah. The, um, uh, so the, the, I, um, similarly with, you know, you're talking about practical effects and I love, love makeup effects like that and practical effects. And I love asking uh, low budget directors uh, what their recommendations for working with those are because you always get some interesting tidbit about some weird mistake they made or something they did. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, we luckily, like I was talking to Melanie pretty early in the process. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what I recommend to all low budget movies is like, Talk to all your department heads really early. Like Gavin and I shot listed the entire movie a long time before we were on set. Um, and similarly with Melanie, we talked through all the big gore gags. I mean, the biggest one is the head rip. And we talked about what angle we would see it from. We would talk, we talk, we, we decided that my producer Ulrich would be playing that role. So because we could have him do the head, the, you know, he had to do a live cast of his head. <laughs> So you definitely want like a friendly doing that. Mm-hmm. Like you want someone who's like a friend of the show uh-huh. uh, doing that and who really like is down to do that. Um, you know, and it was the sort of thing where, uh, um, you know, just talking through how we would accomplish each thing and and what it would look like. Like, yeah, on the set, it was super challenging, especially like doing a decapitation scene in the middle of the night in the freezing yeah. cold. <laughs> and, and like, but it... Uh, you know, and it was, it was the sort of thing where it's like he was supposed to rip off the head, but the blood wasn't really pouring out. And so, like, <laughs> on the set, Nico was like, what if I just hold it here and you just pump a lot of, like, Melanie, like, you just pump a lot of blood, like, from the stump into it. And when I pick it up, it'll just be like a sponge that just drops. <laughs> and that was, the, that was the shot we ended up using was was him doing, I don't know how he thought of that, but he really saved that shot because it looked pretty lame in the mm-hmm. first take where he lifted it up and just, <laughs> like nothing is coming out of it. Uh, but that, that, that he ended up figuring out a way to make it work. And, uh, and yeah, Mel, Melanie did a fantastic job on this. Yeah, just uh, just paper over your mistakes with gallons and gallons of liquid blood. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and honestly, the reason we didn't do any CG, it's not that I'm against CG, but it's like <laughs> I find unless the only micro budget horror movies I've seen with great uh, VFX, like I I've been at a few festivals mm-hmm. with this movie, An Ideal Host, uh, by Robert Woods, it's an Australian film. Like the VFX in those, then that film looks great, but it's because he's a VFX artist and he's yeah, yeah. doing his own effects for like years on that movie. Mm-hmm. Whereas I'm not. I'm not. I'm like I'm an <laughs> old school guy, and so uh, I think that I I went into this thinking like we're gonna get it all in camera, and I think we have like two shots of wire removal for like the bat moving. Mm-hmm. And that's it, you know, like there's nothing real CG in the whole movie. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. So um, I saw that you were the editor of this movie. Yes, and yes. Uh, from experience, that is a lot harder than you might think. Oh, yeah. um, and, you know, I, I love asking about fun developments that you find in the edit because you're always going to find something uh it's never yeah. gonna be the same movie <laughs> yeah you know um it's funny because editing is like my day job I'm I'm a post-production person generally mm-hmm. and uh you know the the my process is always uh, like I do a cut that I feel like um I hope this answers your question I, I do yeah, a cut yeah. that I feel like is like as close as I can get it to like what I had in mind and then I 
you know, before COVID, I would do like a screening at a theater with mm-hmm. lots of people and get feedback on that cut and then do a refined cut from that. Um, because of COVID, I did like private, like Vimeo links to a lot of people and, and just had like an anonymous form. And the note I kept getting back was really weird where they said like, um, they said, oh, I don't get why she shoots Luke over a sweater. And I'm like, well, it's not about the sweater. Like, and the reason was we didn't have those little like flashbacks to like him ripping off the head in the original. <laughs> like originally he just, she said, she meant motions of the sweater. There is no like cut in mm-hmm. to remind you like, hey, Luke is evil. <laughs> like that's the blood of an innocent person all over him. And, but it was those sort of thing. It was that sort of reminder that like people's sympathies will go back and forth between these two leads Mm -hmm. and i and that was like an edit that i was kind of resistant to but i found that the movie played a lot better with those Mm -hmm. little it's it's really i think the only flashback in the movie that's sort of like james wan oh remember what happened 10 minutes ago right right. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) because a lot of crazy shit has happened since then uh so that was the that was one thing that was found in the editing was using little flashes to like catch you up like just to remind you like hey that sweater like has meaning to her because she gave it to him now it's covered in some guy's blood uh and uh you know that was that was one that if i can think of one thing that was that was an edit (laughs) that they came about in that second pass excellent excellent i mean yeah you got to remind your audience of the symbols what's really going on here (laughs) yeah (laughs) Um, so I like to end these interviews with a very simple question, which is off the top of your head. If you could recommend one horror movie, what was it? Uh, what would that be? Just, yeah. I mean, we're recording this right uh, the week of Halloween. Uh, mm-hmm. so I can't really recommend a Christmas horror, but I will recommend a Halloween horror. Okay. Uh, it's one that I, it's, I feel like it's getting a little more love now. It's, uh, it's called Satan's Little Helper. Okay. It's, uh, yeah. It's directed by Joe, Jeff Lieberman. It's from like 2004. It's got one of those covers that you would have seen at Blockbuster that mm-hmm. looks awful, but it's a <laughs> bit of an undiscovered gem because it's set at Halloween. It's about this really strange little boy. I don't know what's going on with this kid. He's a very odd kid. And I say that lovingly. And he's obsessed with the devil. He's obsessed specifically with this video game where you like are Satan's little helper and you're like helping the devil uh you know drag people to hell or whatever and it just so happens there's a serial killer in his neighborhood who's dressed like the devil as he's committing (laughs) his murders and they again it's actually also another brightly lit (laughs) horror movie that's very over the top and almost stilted uh intentionally and of course these characters connect and this kid very slowly much more slowly than I think a normal person uh, uh, would would put this together, realizes that he's actually not involved in an elaborate like Halloween prank, but he's actually helping this killer uh, uh, kill people. And it's almost like if Michael Myers had a little friend, like a little okay. demented friend. Uh, and it's such a weird movie. Um, I think Rosanna Arquette is in it. <laughs> it's, yeah. Is their kind of big name that's in it. Uh, but yeah, I recommend that one to... To people who are, you know, have already gone through all the Halloween movies and trick or treat, like uh, put Satan's Little Helper on your list. <laughs> all right, now, I I gotta see that now. That sounds I think awesome. I think it's on Prime. Okay. I don't know because I own it. <laughs> I'm the proud owner of Satan's Little Helper. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, thank you so much again for talking, Sean. It's been, I've, I've really enjoyed it. Again, this has been Sean Nichols Lynch, the director of Red Snow. And uh, I'm Stephen Tronicek from HorrorOrigins.com. Uh, Horror Origins is a website where you can find articles, reviews, interviews, and we also run our own film festival and screenplay competition. Uh, thank you much, so much again, and see you later. Thanks a lot. See ya.